Welcome back, my friends. Jake here. Today on the channel, we're going to do another question and answer video. Once a month on the community tab, my YouTube channel, I'll put out a question prompt such as this one. Down below, you can ask me anything about anything, read each other's questions, and thumbs up the ones you want me to respond to. The cutoff for this video was 70 thumbs up. Thank you to everyone who left a question. Thank you to everyone who read each other's questions. And for some reason, there were a lot of questions about Donald Trump. The top question was from Tom, 254 thumbs up. And Tom asks, what will happen to Ukraine and NATO if Trump is reelected? And the short answer is nothing good. Donald Trump does not support Ukraine. In the last two and a half years, Donald Trump has not said one critical word of Vladimir Putin or the Russians. Trump has had an open invite to visit Ukraine and see Russian war crimes for himself the last two years. Trump has refused to go. I personally think Trump has no intention of ever meeting with President Zelensky ever again. Trump's standard talking point on the campaign trail is... Uh, he can end the war in 24 hours. Once he's elected president, he, refused to he refuses to explain how this is possible. He's lying. Nobody believes him. But basically, Trump's position is just give Russia whatever they want. If Russia wants the city of Zaporizhia, the city of Kharkiv, the city of Odessa, just give the Russians whatever they want. Ukraine can have whatever Russia doesn't want. There we go. Peace in our time. It's pretty stupid. Now, concerning NATO, Donald Trump threatened NATO. He loves this talking point that the Europeans aren't paying America what they're supposed to be paying us. This is the wrong language, the wrong terminology. This is not true. There is a guideline in NATO, recommended countries spend 2% of their GDP on defense, but... Nobody is paying the United States protection money for our military to protect them from the Russians. But this is how Donald Trump thinks. In my opinion, he just wants to leave NATO and stop associating with these countries. So here's the info charts. Uh, countries in the NATO alliance and what percentage of their GDP they spend on their own defense. And all the countries that Russia might attack, Poland, Estonia, Lithuania, Finland, Romania, Latvia, they're all meeting this guideline. But if Russia wants to invade Poland, Donald Trump will say, because Luxembourg is only spending 0.7% of their GDP on defense, the United States is not going to uphold its Article 5 NATO commitments. I think this is a guarantee if Donald Trump wins, he will pull the United States out of NATO and let Russia do whatever Russia wants to do. And just, you know, from a casual observer, this is obvious. Donald Trump does not feel comfortable around other Democratic leaders. He hates Mexico. He hates Canada. He hates France. He hates Germany. <laughs> He doesn't care about Japan or South Korea. On all of these foreign visits and foreign trips, he never gets along with other democratically elected leaders. But Donald Trump loves dictators. You'll never see his smile as big or him having as much fun as when he gets together with Kim Jong-un or MBS or Vladimir Putin or President Xi. Trump just envies these men who have absolute unchecked power. These men get to kill whoever they want, whenever they want. There is no free press or free speech in their countries. They can silence all criticism. And they get to stay in office forever. So Donald Trump, when he gets together with a dictator, this makes him really excited, really happy. He sometimes even wears matching pajamas with uh, mass murderers. Next question is from Cecil. Will you join the convoy in Ukraine? Thank you for everything you're doing. You bring humanity to difficult topics. 
it's important work. I've gotten this question a lot, and the answer is no. I am not going to go to the convoy in which my 30 brohicles are going to be delivered to Ukraine. And I live on the west coast of the United States, so I want to give you guys some insight of how difficult of a trip this would be for me to go on. To fly from Las Vegas to Estonia would be two stops. We've got a three-hour flight from Nevada to Texas, and then a 10-hour uh, flight from Texas to Helsinki, and then another connecting flight to get to Estonia. Once I'm in Estonia and I join the convoy, this would be a 21-hour car trip through the Baltics and Poland to get to the capital city of Kyiv. I would then have to take the train back to Warsaw and then fly back to the United States. This would be a solid six days of traveling and being on the move just to drop off some vehicles. I understand the significance and I could vlog and I could do interviews and I could see the country for myself, but I just don't see this happening for me in either June or July. In the future, if we do another fundraiser, I do want to make this trip. I do want to go to Ukraine, but I would rather do it in the fall rather than this summer. Next question, can a new president stop aid to Ukraine that has already been approved by Congress? And a, pre a president shouldn't if Congress allocated it. But obviously this question is referring to what if Donald Trump becomes elected? And if Donald Trump is elected, he's in charge of the military. He's the commander in chief. And even if Congress allocates weapons or funds to support Ukraine, Donald Trump will just tell the military to not do anything, to cut off all aid, to stop helping Ukraine in any way. I do believe this is what he's planning to do. That is how he says he can end this conflict within 24 hours. The Department of Defense will just stop supporting Ukraine in every way possible. Doesn't matter what Congress says, does, or wants. Donald Trump controls one of our two major political parties. The only thing Congress can do, if they're upset, is impeach Trump. And Senate Republicans are never going to impeach Trump ever. Sure, there could be a challenge in courts, and Congress could try to get a court order to force Donald Trump to comply with federal law. But I don't really have a lot of faith in the Supreme Court these days. Donald Trump appointed three people, Amy Barrett Cohen, uh, Gorsuch, and Kavanaugh. And some of the legacy conservatives on the Supreme Court are pretty despicable. Clarence Thomas, this has been revealed over the last 20 years, has been accepting bribes and money and gifts from billionaires. Billionaires with business before the court. And this guy doesn't give an F. Clarence Thomas isn't going to be alive much longer. He's probably the most corrupt Supreme Court justice in history. And this guy loves Donald Trump. He will do anything to protect Donald Trump. Another legacy conservative justice, Samuel Alito, controversy this week is he was flying a flag upside down to represent the Stop the Steal movement in protest of the 2020 election. And when you become a Supreme Court justice, you're supposed to be neutral. You're supposed to be fair and balanced. Uh, you know, you're, you're supposed to be the ref in baseball calling balls and strikes. You can't be a ref for a New York Yankees game and show up wearing a New York Yankees cap. But people on the Supreme Court, once you're there, you can't be removed. It's a lifetime appointment. And some of these conservative justices don't care. They're in the bag for Trump. Whatever Trump wants, they're going to do it. And there's going to be some pretty important Supreme Court cases decided relating to Donald Trump over the next couple months. I don't have faith in the Supreme Court to defend the Constitution or defend our democracy. I think Trump's going to win all of these Supreme Court cases 6 to 3 or 5 to 4 because the Republican-appointed justices on the Supreme Court 
for whatever reason, want to give Donald Trump a free pass. We had a violent insurrection in which police officers died. People died on January 6th. Millions of dollars damaged, stuff stolen from our capital. I, I, I don't understand this. I'll never understand this. I know there's people watching this video who plan to vote for Donald Trump again. And all I can tell you is, if you support democracy, if you support NATO, if you support Ukraine, then you have to vote for Joe Biden. As Americans, we only get two options every four years. If you can't bring yourself to vote for Joe Biden, then please don't vote. Don't vote for Donald Trump. He's a fascist. He's dangerous. He's going to get a lot of people killed if he's reelected. Next question, with renewed funding from the United States, a more invested Europe and F-16s and many shells coming from Czechia, what are Ukraine's chances of a successful counteroffensive this year to cut off the land route to Crimea? It's not 0%, but it's pretty darn close. Ukraine just doesn't have the manpower or resources to successfully get to the Sea of Azov. Uh, the next counteroffensive is going to be the same as the last one. Ukraine has to get to Mariupol, Berdansk, or Melitopol in order to cut off Crimea. This is just a tall ask of Ukraine at this moment. 2025 is going to be different. As long as uh, aid from the West continues and grows, gets bigger. But Russia is also escalating the war, converting to a wartime economy, mobilizing and drafting and signing contracts for new soldiers. Russia is a giant. What they lack in precision and skill, they make up for in mass. They just have a lot of people and a lot of resources, and a lot of stuff. What's keeping Ukraine in the game is Russian incompetence, Russian corruption, and their toxic culture. So I don't, I don't think the counteroffensive is happening this year. Ukraine has to hold on. They need to train and, and mobilize more men, get more resources. Hold out through the winter. This is going to be another bad winter for Russia. But I think in spring or summer of 2025, that'll be the time for Ukraine to make their move. Next question. Is there anyone that can pressure Russia to allow the International Red Cross to inspect Ukrainian POWs? Starsky's friend described fighting a dog over a scrap of bread. Another returnee said he ate rats and worms to survive. And many and m most are tortured. Ukrainians don't like to depict themselves as victims, but this is awful treatment, and it ought to be countered somehow. The short answer is the only one who can pressure Russia to do anything is China and India. China and India have this looming threat that they could participate in Western sanctions to destroy the Russian economy, but I don't see... Uh, India or China intervening and putting pressure on Russia because they don't care about Ukraine and they don't care about POWs. I understand the spirit of your question and for me it's also heartbreaking seeing these interviews and these videos of returning Ukrainian POWs. They've been beaten, they've been tortured, they've been raped, they've been starved. And, and Russia has no morals. If people can see these interviews when they're returned and they're not outraged at the treatment of these POWs, then this is something that uh, Russia will be held accountable for once the war is over. For everyone in Europe who said never again concerning the Nazis and the Holocaust, this is that moment. This is the again happening right now. Next question from Darkest Alice. Hello, Jake. Can you explain how decommissioning works? Who is responsible for destroying weapons that are past their expiry? Can it be done in Ukraine? 
do you know why President Biden does not use the EDA mechanism through which the Pentagon can transfer military property no longer needed to allied and friendly countries like Germany almost for free? Thanks for all the support you provide to Ukraine. Your work is highly appreciated. I'm not going to talk extensively about this because I don't know too much. Uh, EDA stands for Excess Defense Articles. Purpose of the program transfers excess defense equipment to foreign governments or international organizations, typically used for modernization of partner forces. And here's the answer you're not going to like. Ukraine is not a partner force or an allied country. The United States has treaties with Germany and Canada and Australia and South Korea and Japan, Israel. The United States does not have a defense treaty or defense cooperation with Ukraine. If President Biden tried to sign an executive order, he could, but that's not the same as Congress voting on it. And I don't see Congress voting on some kind of defense cooperation treaty with Ukraine as long as the war is actively going on with Russia. That could be the reason why Biden has not used this program. I, I honestly don't know, but that's my suspicion. So the aid that Ukraine is getting is going to have to be allocated from Congress and then sent by the DOD. Concerning the EDA program, I think these weapons are going to continue going to places like Thailand and the Philippines and South Korea. How is it that Trump can have so much influence in this country and hold no political office? Have politicians do his bidding like Johnson and Green, and our government can do nothing about it? What can be done to prevent this from happening again? Well, let's start with how could we have prevented this situation and if the Senate in 2020 had just voted to impeach Donald Trump, he had two weeks left in office or whatever, if the Senate had just impeached Donald Trump, then he would be barred from ever running for election again. He still would have had a massive following and lots of supporters, but he wouldn't be the Republican nominee right now. I think... Lisa Murkowski and Mitt Romney and Bob Corker, there were some Senate Republicans who voted to impeach him after the January 6th insurrection. But Senate Republicans like Mitch McConnell and Lindsey Graham didn't like the political optics of impeaching their own president, so they allowed this to happen. They allowed Trump to come back. And Trump's power comes from his cult following of the, the, the primary base. These people are nuts. The people that show up with hats and multiple flags and t-shirts go into the rallies. They accept everything Donald Trump wants of them without question. It's a cult. And uh, to illustrate my point, I have to remind people of this book published in 2010. So this was you know, the Tea Party in 2010 was kicking off, Barack Obama was president, and the name of this book is Young Guns, A New Generation of Conservative Leaders. Paul Ryan, Eric Cantor, and Kevin McCarthy. Young Guns. Well, what happened to these three guys? Eric Cantor was the House Majority Leader, and he lost a primary in 2014. Paul Ryan was Speaker of the House, uh, but didn't get along with Trump. And rather than clash with Trump, he just retired. He resigned from office uh, in the midterm election during Trump's uh, first term. So Kevin McCarthy came, came in and took over as Speaker of the House, and Donald Trump knifed him in the back. He got Matt Gates to uh, w remove him from the chair, so McCarthy's political career was over, and he just resigned from Congress. If you're an independent-thinking conservative voice in the Republican Party, Donald Trump will destroy you. Donald Trump only wants yes-men kissing his ass, basically, uh, in Congress. So these are Trump's preferred Congress people. People like Lowen Orrin Boebert, 
Marjorie Trader Greene, and Matt Gates. And Trump's willing to endorse anyone who's young, dumb, inexperienced, and will just do whatever he says. And the prime example I have to mention is Anna Paulina Luna. This woman is 35 years old, and uh, her backstory is a little weird. One of her grandfathers was a Nazi in World War II. The others probably came here illegally from Mexico. They're, they're border jumpers. And she's a former stripper at the Red Rose Gentlemen's Club. But she got elected to Congress. Why did she get elected to Congress? And it's because in the Republican primary, Donald Trump endorsed her. That's all it takes to win a Republican primary. Donald Trump sends out an email, sends out a tweet, poses with you for a picture. That's how strong his cult following is. So why, why are there so many senators and congressmen who are just sycophants and yes-men? And it's because they don't, they don't get to have power. They don't, get to, they don't get to be elected to Congress unless they win a primary. And you don't win a primary unless Donald Trump endorses you. It's not 100%. There are exceptions. Lots of people who Trump has endorsed, like Dr. Oz in, in Pennsylvania, they win the primary and then they lose the general election because they're a shit candidate. But Donald Trump doesn't care who loses the general elections. He just wants to make sure that all the primary winners are loyal to him. That's why Trump has so much power right now. Next question. How did this war change you as a human being? That's a very good question. And at the moment on Netflix, I'm watching the docu-series Turning Point, The Bomb and the Cold War. If you have a Netflix account, I highly recommend you watch this. It's nine episodes, pretty good. And they're going through the history of the Cold War and basically how we got to this point today. Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine in 2020. And this is the America that I grew up with the ethos and lore and history as a child in the 90s. The 90s was a really good decade for the United States. And we used to talk about the great American presidents. Uh, John F. Kennedy was the great Democrat. Ronald Reagan was the great Republican. They gave these lofty, soaring, inspiring speeches to... America's never been a perfect country, but we always... I believe, have been striving to be a more perfect union. As flawed and as complicated as a nation that's multiracial, multiethnic, every language is represented, every religion is represented here in the United States, we have our problems, but we still try to unite as Americans under the principles of democracy. I read the biography, Alexander Hamilton, by Ron Trineau. This inspired the Broadway play. And this is such a fantastic book. Alexander Hamilton was mixed race, but he claimed from his father's lineage to be from this noble family in Scotland. But he came from the Caribbean. He was an orphan. He came to the United States when he was like 16 or 17. And the guy within a decade, rose in the ranks to become George Washington's right-hand man. If, Al if Aaron Burr hadn't assassinated him, he would have been president someday. So there's so many inspiring stories in American history of people who came from nothing and were able to achieve greatness. That's the American dream. That's the America I believe in. And tying back to your, your question, I, I think in the last decade we've lost this. I think the United States is just dithering with the catastrophe that was the Bush invasion of Iraq. It's been different. The, the last 20 years of my life have felt different than the first 20 years, which I think opened this window for people like Donald Trump. Donald Trump makes fun of veterans, he makes fun of disabled people, he makes fun of women and minorities. He's literally an internet troll that manifested itself 
and became a real boy. This isn't the America that I believe in, and I think Ukraine has inspired a lot of people to push back against this movement of retraction and regression that Donald Trump represents. So this is going to be a testing point with the November election. I hope America chooses widely, wisely, because given these questions and how many people thumbs up them, a lot of people around the world are looking to the United States for guidance. Joe Biden is not perfect, but he's doing his best. And in my opinion, Donald Trump is working for the other team. He loves authoritarians and dictators. We've gotten to the point where stating facts doesn't really change anyone's opinion, whether or not they're going to support Donald Trump. Trump met with white nationalist Nick Fuentes at Mar-a-Lago. He invited this Nazi to dinner with him at Mar-a-Lago. Donald Trump has appeared on Infowars with Alex Jones. He loves Alex Jones, and Alex Jones is completely crazy, pushing the most insane conspiracy theories, and Alex Jones is a huge supporter of Russia. At the moment, Trump is on trial for using campaign funds to pay hush money to a porn star. He slept with, I think like back in 2006, right after Melania had their child, Baron Trump. And no one's really disputing whether or not he did this. They took a photo together at the celebrity golf events. He 100% was sleeping with whoever he could sleep with whenever he wanted. And to me, this is shocking that Americans don't care about this kind of stuff. Conservatives, evangelicals, don't seem to care about this stuff. I don't get it. But let's wrap up this question with a quote and inspiration, because this is the kind of American I am. This is from FDR. Democracy alone, of all forms of government, enlists the full force of men's enlightened will. So I'm always trying to improve myself, be a better person. I try to help other people, improve them whenever I can. Because we live in a collective society. Everyone should be trying to get better. Because that benefits me. And that's the kind of world I want to live in. Next question. Do you think the economic wear and tear on the Russian economy and people is the only viable way to defeat Russia. Due to USA fumbling, have we rendered Ukrainians military to a mere defensive war that will have to go the long term to win? Okay, so how does this war end? Uh, the quickest way is somebody just takes out Vladimir Putin. If in the Kremlin there's a coup or an assassination, I do think whoever replaces Putin will want to barter, they'll want to negotiate. The deal will be, recognize me as a legitimate new leader of Russia, and I'll pull out of the occupied territories. I'll end this war. I think the West would take that deal. So Putin could die at any moment, and that would be an abrupt end to the conflict. But the other way is a political and economic collapse of the Russian state. People who support Russia says... This isn't possible. This is never going to happen. But based on historical precedent, Russia's the most likely country in the world to have an economic collapse. They've done it twice in the last 105 years. There's, of course, the October Revolution in 1917 during World War I. The Russian Empire collapsed. They had a civil war. And then there was the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991. This was thankfully more peaceful, but still an economic collapse of the Russian system. Russia's just cursed. It's cold, it's dark, the soil's not that great, their geography sucks. Most of their rivers uh, flow north to the Arctic Ocean, so they're not navigable or, or useful for exports because the Arctic Ocean still freezes for now. This is why Russia is always creeping into other parts of the world. They basically want better geography. This is why Russia wants Ukraine so bad. Ukraine has 
honestly fantastic geography. Ukraine has the possibility to be a very prosperous and wealthy country, you know, in like 30 years, because they've been blessed with wonderful geography. The economic rise and, and, and power of a country like Poland over the last 20 years, the same process will repeat in Ukraine the second they can become free of uh, Russian dominion. Next question, why do Americans never protest Putin's genocide, but they like to protest against Israel? So this is, a, uh, I, I think, a good question to a stupid situation. Uh, first, I want to say is that Americans have been protesting. These are mostly pro-Ukrainian rallies. There's not really a point to doing an anti-Russia rally because the United States doesn't support Russia. People are protesting against Israel because the United States is supporting Israel. That's the first connection I want to make. But concerning the media coverage of all these student protests against Israel or in favor of Gaza and the Palestinians, this is what college kids do. My entire time in college, there were protests all the time. 19 and 20 year olds, let's just be fair, they're idiots. That's why they go to college, to get smarter. And I think a lot of them have fallen victim to propaganda and disinformation from the Chinese, through TikTok. When you talk to these young people on universities and say, where do you get your information about the conflict between the Palestinians and the Israelis, they're probably going to tell you TikTok. The Chinese are doing this. They're responsible for it. But to counter this, these protests don't matter. These kids are basically shouting into the void. If they got no media coverage, then nobody would even know they were happening. So the media coverage of these student protests is politically motivated to help Israel and hurt the Palestinians, to highlight how dumb and stupid these people are. I've seen... I've seen the interviews on YouTube, you know, you ask one of these average college kids from the river to the sea, what river, what sea, they can't answer. What does chanting from the river to the sea even mean? They can't answer. Uh, all these queers for Palestine, <laughs> queers for Palestine, you know, if you're, if you're LGBT and you try to go to Palestinian controlled territory, they're going to murder you. That's what they do to LGBT people in most Arab countries. They just kill you. So I don't, I don't understand this. I think these uh, college students are victims. But I also think they should be ignored. This is not top-tier news, in my opinion. Next question is from Martin. How does it feel to have run a fundraising campaign for Ukraine that raised over 1 million euros? Well done, brother you are making a huge difference. And it feels pretty good. I knew my initial fundraising goal of only $40,000 was a bar deliberately set low. My secret goal was always $100,000. And my wildest dream goal was $200,000. At $200,000, that already would have been the largest ever NAFO 69th Brigade fundraising campaign. But you can see it for yourself, it's still going. $1,185,000. Thank you so much to everyone who kicked in, who participated in this historic fundraiser. A lot of people in Ukraine heard about this and were deeply moved. I will link the donor box, uh, the donor box page down below if you want to read some of these comments. On the donor wall, 3,218 people, these are people who donated, they chose to share their name, share the amounts, or leave a message. If you want to read some of these heartfelt messages, this might help bolster your faith in humanity, but all you people are heroes. Thank you so much. Next question is from Dan. Do you think Russia Putin have back-channel communications with the Trump campaign about a deal to partition Ukraine? At the moment, no. 
I don't think uh, Putin and the Russians are trying to talk to or communicate with uh, the Trump campaign at all because they were in 2016 and that led to uh, yeah, Robert Mueller's uh, special investigation. But in U.S. politics, U.S. history, there's never been a candidate, Republican or Democrat, who has been tied directly to so many people with ties to Russia. The most obvious uh, is Paul Manafort. This was Trump's initial campaign manager in 2016. Uh, this is what Paul Manafort looks like. And Paul Manafort was the American lobbyist hired by Viktor Yanukovych to basically make Viktor Yanukovych look good to the West. Viktor Yanukovych was Putin's man to control Ukraine. Viktor Yanukovych murdered a lot of people during the Maidan revolution in 2014. He then fled the country. The president of Ukraine in 2014 fled the country to take sanctuary in Russia. The Russians and Putin are still protecting this guy from his crimes of murdering his own people. And Paul Manafort was his PR guy. And in 2016, this is who Trump wanted to be his campaign manager. It's inexplicable. But Trump is just connected to so many people who love Russia. People like Steve Bannon, people like Alex Jones. The creepiest and weirdest one is Roger Stone. Roger Stone, I guess, has Trump, you know, they talk on the phone frequently and Roger Stone is all over anything to do with helping Russia. It's so stupid if Trump gets reelected, I, I think he might appoint Steven Seagal to be Secretary of Defense. It's going to get that stupid if Trump wins in 2024. So all the polls say the, the race is close, the race is competitive, the big dollars aren't really spent on advertising and media buys until after the convention. So we're not going to take these polls too seriously uh, prior to August, but if you're American, please wake up, please pay attention, democracy's on the line. That's all for this Q&A. Thank you so much to everyone who participated. I greatly appreciate your support for the channel. That's all for this video. Till the next time, take care everyone.